It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rich Margiata. Um, he is a person whose work I've been familiar with for a number of years. Um, one of my first PhD topics was travel time reliability, and that is what he specializes in. Um, he works for Cambridge Systematics, and he has 29 years of experience in transportation planning and engineering including working for TRB, uh, the University of Tennessee, and Knoxville Metropolitan Planning Organization. His PhD is from UT, so I'll leave it up to you guys whether that's good thing or that no. Um, and his recent work has focused on congestion monitoring, performance management, and travel time reliability. And the best way that I can think of to introduce the concept of travel time reliability is for you guys to imagine for a second that there are two buckets in front of me and one is filled with boiling hot water and the other one is filled with freezing cold water. And if I stand in these two buckets, on average, I feel great, right? <laughs> so in the transportation world, it's the same way. That if you have a commute that one day is 10 minutes and one day is 50 minutes, on average, that's a half an hour commute. But how do you plan around that? How do you take that into account with all the decisions that you're making? And that's a lot of the work that Rich does focuses on those types of concepts. So with that, I'd like to welcome Mr. Thanks for having me. No football jokes. <laughs> um, I'm a principal at Cambridge Systematics. I've been working in the reliability field for about a decade. I'm lucky enough to do some of the uh, that initial work in, in travel time reliability for, for the uh, Federal Highway Administration. And what I'm going to report on today is mainly research that I and others have uh, conducted for the Strategic Highway Research Program, which is a TRB uh, program. It's funded by the states, and it it's, has four, uh, four basic research areas, reliability being one of those research areas. So they're very, very large, well-funded research projects. And, uh, Sharp 2, most of the research is either it has been funded, it's either a complete, in the case of the project I worked on, or ongoing. But it's, a, it's a due to sunset here in the next, uh, next year next year or so. So we'll cover some uh, basic definitions and concepts of the travel time reliability. Talk very briefly about the Shark 2 research program, I already introduced it. I uh, really wanted to talk about the research project that, uh, that I conducted for, for Shark 2. Uh, Project L03, Analytical Procedures for Estimating the Impacts of uh, Travel Time Reliability. And then do some uh, future, uh, a future look into reliability. What's next? What's, what's on the horizon? What needs to be, what's currently being done and explored in the uh, Sharp 2 Research Program? And what remains to be done beyond that? So what is this thing called uh, Travel Time Reliability? It really is about the extremes. It's not about the average. It's about the extremes. These tend to be the events that travelers remember when they start making traveling, traveling decisions. And research that, uh, research that has been conducted by others have indicated that travelers incorporate reliability into the decision process as part of uh, when they make decisions about when to travel, where to travel, and, and how to travel. <coughs> uh, a basic concept uh, that we, we defined was uh, Travel time reliability is a consistency in travel times for the same trip from, from day to day. How do travel times change over the course of time, uh, over, over the course of, of, a, brief, of a brief history? Uh, there are alternate definitions that have been floated around by, by, by many. The most common, of course, is the uh, variability. The reliability can be defined by the variability in travel times as they occur from, from day to day. But these other two definitions are, e are related, they're almost corollaries to that because they come off of this basic concept that travel times are, are highly, highly varied. Uh, what's the amount of time that a system uh, fails or succeeds, depending on a, a preset pre standard, classical definition of system reliability from the engineering world, and also this notion of, of uh, predictability. How can we predict what reliability is going to be based on past, past history? Sort of like the weather forecast that occurs to reliability. Well, they're, they're, all, they're all equally valid, but for our purposes, I think for, for measuring and reporting and forecasting, variability is really the underlying concept that we need to, need to deal with with reliability. Well, what it, reliability varies because of factors that influence 
travel times uh, as they occur on the city all the time. Now, when I was in grad school many years ago, back in the Pleistocene era, length was very simple. We had the highway capacity in the world. We have got a static volume, a static capacity, combined it, and we got performance. Congestion was easy to forecast and to measure back then. Well, the problem is that the system is totally dynamic and it's totally fluctuating all the time. Things are never, never the same from day to day. Demand can change because of special events or just due to seasonal or day-to-day -day changes in volumes. Uh, if you measure demand over, over the course of a week, you'll find for the same time period highly variable conditions in the demand when you use a, a highway section. <coughs> Uh, physical capacity is never constant. We implement, uh, we use traffic control devices to meter uh, capacity both on the high, high freeways and, sig and signalized highways. But more importantly, are the effect of these of disruptions that can occur on, on the highway system that effectively steal capacity from, from, from the highway. These are bad weather incidents and work zones. These are all uh, uh, events or disruptions in traffic flow that lower the physical capacity, which causes travel times to, to increase. And all these, uh, all these uh, seven factors, is what we call the seven, seven sources of congestion, conspire to produce both reliability and total congestion <coughs> over time. So to understand reliability, we really have to understand all these seven factors. And I've, what I've done is given seven, uh, given numbers to all seven numbers. And, and try to document the effect on total congestion. That way we can start to understand what reliability is really all about. Uh, from a practical sense, this is some data from a 15 mile corridor in Seattle uh, from, their, from their detector system. And you can see if we were dealing with just averages, um, on average, uh, speed might be, uh, travel times might be somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 minutes for this, uh, uh, for this section. But things are never, never the same from day to day. And you can see the effect of low demand on the holidays, as well as the effect of incidents in rain over the course of time. So things are never never the same on the system. They're constantly in flux. They're constantly variable. So what we want to be able to do is capture this and be able to measure it. And the way to do that is really with a, a travel time distribution. This is the most practical way to measure a, a travel time reliability. All the important metrics for reliability come off of this distribution. I describe the size and shape of this uh, distribution. By the way, this is the same slide as before, transposed into a travel <coughs> distribution. And we can start to develop different metrics based on this, on this distribution. Notice that it's, it's highly skewed out to the, to the right because of the effect of very severe of, of the disruptions on hollow and hollow as well. And we're not so much interested in what happens down in this range. This is, you know, this is, these are the good days. These are the days we really don't care about. The important metrics will describe what happened on the right side of, of, of that curve. And let's put a couple, of the, uh, couple of the measures up there. A more comprehensive and abstracted look. This is, this is, to, this is not real data. This is, this is totally, totally made up. And it it uh, demonstrates the fact that there are alternate measures that can be used to define the size and shape of this distribution. Which one's the best? Uh, we're still working on that. Well, we have some research, I'll present some research in a minute that will help narrow it down a bit. But any, any metric that describes the shape of the upper, upper side of the, uh, of the curve is, is valid. And in all likelihood, you need to report multiple measures if you're doing performance monitoring. Because they all tell you something slightly different. And various applications will use different measures. For example, the evaluation of reliability. Researchers have chosen a variety of these of, uh, statistical measures as the indicator, they've used standard deviation, they've used the various percentiles. But it's, it's somewhat trivial at the point if you have the travel time distribution developed. It's, just, it's very simple to extract and compute uh, the, the uh, different metrics. The key is having that distribution. So why is this, what, what's all the fuss about, the, about travel time uh, reliability? Why is it really important? Why should we, why should we care about it? Well, the traditional view of how travelers behave and what the value of, of travel is to, to, uh, to users is based on the notion of average or, or typical travel time. Maybe an artifact of, 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 the, uh, of the fact that we don't have the data on, on, on how travel times vary. But traditionally, we've only dealt with uh, the typical or average travel time. But other research has shown that it definitely has value, reliability has 
value to both travelers and especially the shippers as we move into a more just-in-time environment for deliveries. Travel time reliability, the ability to predict when you can show up for a delivery is becoming extremely important. And you don't want to have a highly variable system if you want to be able, able to uh, predict. Um, just, just on this notion of the valuation of reliability, uh, VOR is the value of reliability, VOT is the value of uh, typical or average travel time. And research has been done showing that they're roughly equal. What this means is in our evaluations of, how, of uh, highway projects, uh, we're undercounting the benefits to travelers if we don't account for reliability. It's an extra valuation that travelers place on, uh, on transportation service that has not been captured. Now I'd like to just talk about the uh, uh, some of the research that in detail that, that I that I conducted for the Shark 2 program. This is an overview of the reliability focus area. There are four areas, one on capacity, one on capacity, one on safety, and one on uh, highway renewal, how do we make more effective uh, decisions about where and when to uh, and how to uh, reconstruct reconstruct highways. But the reliability is one of the four uh, one of the four areas. There are four themes that run run through the uh, uh, the, the, the research area. Uh, I have a large team of supporting characters so very helpful to, to us in conducting the uh, in, uh, conducting the research, a mix of academics and consultants. Um, Nick, the title of the project as as you saw is well, this is very descriptive of the objective of our of our project. We have to do what effect do our transportation improvements have on travel time reliability. Well, you basically have two choices from an analysis. You can do modeling or develop models of, of, uh, 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 of reliability using simulation models, existing traffic flow theory uh, models, or you can use an empirical approach. We decided early on that we thought that the data had matured to the point where the empirical approach was practical. Nobody's had, had tackled this before. We, had, we thought it was, it was time uh, that someone, someone actually took an empirical view of travel time reliability and tried to develop models based on empirical data rather than uh, uh, model, model data. Well, that implies a whole, if you've ever dealt with empirical data, you know it's a messy business. Um, there's a lot of problems with empirical data, uh, not just in quality, but in just getting, getting hold of, of, the, uh, of the data. For reliability, one of the main challenges is in order to develop a travel time distribution, you need continuously collected travel time data in order to have enough observations to capture all the variables <coughs> that could possibly happen uh, to, to, a, to a trip over to, to a trip over time. So you really need a year of continuous data. It's very close, something very close to a year of data being continuously measured. Totally impractical for the team to in, go out and in, instrument enough uh, uh, locations with, with the project funds available to, to do this. So we relied on the goodwill of many of our uh, traffic management centers from around the country who are, are, who are collecting data continuously <coughs> and storing, one of which is right here in Atlanta. Atlanta is my favorite laboratory, by the way. I live, I live in Knoxville, about three hours away. I'm, I'm always down here looking for, looking for congestion. So a lot of native equipment is really only practical way, automated equipment run by others. Now we had some experience with, with uh, various locations around the country. So we, we knew who was doing a good job at collecting the data, maintaining the field equipment, and doing and <coughs> storing it and, uh, and, correcting, uh, and correcting the data. So we felt we had a, a good starting point. We knew what a good, the good folks were in terms of, in terms of data collection. Uh, so that, that's basically this piece, the uh, strategy that we uh, <coughs> we did very little original data collection. Most of our time was spent in assembling, cleaning, and more importantly, fusing all the data sources you need to understand reliability. Remember that model of congestion, the seven sources of congestion? Well, here, here they are in terms of what we needed to do in order to capture it from a data perspective. Uh, a few notes on, on, our, on our data. This is going back about 2000, our latest data set that we have was 2008, so it's 2008 and before. At that time, most of the data widely available, continuous travel time data, was on urban freeways. Very little data existed for long distance rural trips or on signalized highways. If we were starting to study now, uh, we probably would take a different <coughs> approach, because there are many more data sources now available um, uh, other than urban freeway detected data. From, 
on the single materials or Bluetooth. There are a lot of private vendors now entering the market collecting uh, travel time data from GPS uh, equipped vehicles that they have raised and raised with. So the first by Pinrix, Navtech, uh, TomTom, and I, I know I'm going to say at least one other. Uh, I, I, name is case. But they offer data, basically travel time data, for sale, primarily the travel information market. But clearly, it has applications for performance monitoring and research. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have, we, we actually looked at some of that data, uh, GPS vehicle based data for arterials. Um, at that time, there simply was not enough measurements in, in the samples to allow us to say the. Uh, I, that is, that is, by the way, that's changed. For those of you who are interested in the data, that's, that's an, an outdated statement because the vendors are constantly looking for ways to improve their product. They're adding more sources, they're getting better at the processing of the information. So um, the, the data limitations that we face have uh, either largely gone away or very soon will go away, uh, go away, all, go away altogether. So here's, a, here's the, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to get the data, get the data right. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a, a, a bigger task than we thought, particularly with the incident data, because it is just all over the map. Traffic data is traffic data. The measurements are basically the same no matter where you go. Uh, weather data, we have National Weather Service data, fairly standard. <coughs> incident data and some of the geometric data, that just, it just varies completely from agency to agency. So there's very little consistency. A lot of hand uh, <coughs> interpolation with a lot of, of, of the data sources. We broke the analysis into four basic, uh, four basic categories. Um, we, were, we were tasked to really do foundational research for the rest of the program. So we did uh, quite a bit of exploratory analysis on, on uh, some relatively mini research topics, not only to help us to do the, the more detailed modeling, but to help understand the reliability in general. Um, if you were trying to uh, uh, understand the effect of improvements on travel time reliability, I think the gold standard would be a classically controlled before and after study of allowed measure conditions before an improvement and after an improvement, perhaps with control. Uh, we didn't have that luxury because our, we, don't have, we didn't have control over the data. So we had hoped that there would be some before and after conditions in the data after the fact. So it's like post hoc experimental design, uh, such a thing that even exists. I hope there's no statisticians. <laughs> so, Fortunately, there were some before <coughs> but our main approach was to develop an empirically based statistical model that would allow us to predict uh, reliability. Uh, finally, this issue of congestion by source, the congestion pie, if you will. How much of congestion is due to each one of those seven sources, and can they be related back to uh, 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 underlying or background factors like traffic level, uh, incident characteristics, and so on. So these are the four basic categories of analysis. Um, exploratory analysis, I'm not, I'm not going to read all of these, I'll just highlight a few, undertook 12 of these uh, basically small projects, random project, uh, to nail, nail down some of the uh, issues that we we're going to deal with later on. Um, a few of these, uh, two of these I present, this one will real quick, but how much data is enough for travel time uh, for that ability? Uh, we did some experiments with punching holes in, in, in the data. We took a year's worth of data on some segments. The TTI is the travel time index. Does anybody know what the travel time index is? The performance <coughs> it's, it's really simple. It's the uh, ideal, travel, uh, ideal travel time uh, divided, or excuse me, it's the actual travel time divided by the ideal travel time. So it's a ratio. It says it's always greater than one. It's 1 1.2 of these travel times, 20% worse or higher than what you normally do in the best, best condition. Uh, the buffer, the is the buffer index, one of the measures of, of that spread in, in, in the distribution. As you might imagine, it's a lot easier to estimate the mean than, than the variance. And what this, what this really told us is, well, we're not really going to get by with uh, anything less than a year's worth of data for, uh, for uh, understanding the reliability. Uh, we developed some distributions for uh, signalized arterials and uh, long-distance rural trips. Uh, these are uh, these are very common distributions for uh, for signalized arterials. You see this major hump here with a small tail out to the right. Uh, for uh, rural rural freeways, which are relatively uncongested, and let me go here first. Uh, you'll see a much more pronounced skew in, in the data. This is a long-distance trip 
from uh, Washington, D.C. to the George Washington Bridge. What's it, 247 miles uh, taken over the, over the course of a, uh, uh, this was five, five months, five months worth, worth, of, worth of data. Uh, long distance trips are a little bit different than how you have to process it because you've got a time dependency in the data. Our data, the data that we deal with are not from uh, travel times from point A to point B. They're points on, they're on links of the, of the highway network. Uh, similar to the, uh, the, the detector data that comes from uh, traffic management centers. You get a speed attached to a link. The same thing is true with the Google Pro data that comes from private vendors. Same thing is true for um, uh, Bluetooth related data, although it, 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 that tends, they tend to have longer, longer segments. So when you have a, have a network that's based on link-based travel times, just simply summing it up for a time period is erroneous because where a vehicle is in that network will depend on what, what travel times it's exposed to. So you have to do kind of a, a, a mini simulation. Send the vehicle out every five minutes and expose it to the network and the speeds and the time and space and develop and distribution. Uh, this is the, the same trip looking at the this is the trip that starts at 4 p.m. and where it gets delayed at the various various points in, in, its, in its trip. Um, it, these are really we, we're not quite sure what this what these long distance trips uh, trip data really mean other than the fact that nobody's ever done it before. Uh, nobody ha we have no data on the performance of long distance trips. We used to have some survey data that was available many years ago but even that's gone. So the data sources that are out there now allow you to do, do things like this. Uh, this is uh, pretty darn interesting. If you ever travel the Northeast Corridor during the Thanksgiving weekend, this is a pretty obvious uh, to uh, what happens to travel times on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and the, and, the, and the Sunday after. These are the averages, and this is what happens on those two, those two particular days. And you can start to understand patterns in, in travel time with this, with this uh, continuous data. One, one of the things we thought we would do is test the uh, ability of the metrics to detect changes in the travel time performance. This is some data from uh, from from Atlanta for three three years on our ten our ten study. <coughs> if you track the uh, travel time index, which is an indicator of the average or typical condition, you see from 2006 to 2007 uh, things got worse, but in 2008 because the economy tanked, things got better. Uh, if you look at the 95th percentile travel time, which is per, my personal favorite metric, but not to say that it has to be yours, um, it also got better in 2007, but it also it dropped again in, uh, 2000, in 2008. The buffer index behaved uh, in an opposite fashion. We would expect it to also get better because it's an indicator of reliability, so we'd expect its value to go down. What, what the heck happened here? It actually went up with all the other indicators got better. Well, the problem is the buffer index is composed of both the 95th percentile and the mean. And they change at different, uh, at different rates. So you can get screwy results like, like this when you start tracking, uh, uh, tracking performance over time. And there have been other metrics that are combinations of two, two, other, two other metrics like that. Uh, and if you start to use it, you can end up with uh, non-intuitive results if you start using those. So we're, we, we recommend using those types of metrics with extreme caution. They still tell you something useful about the system, but you know, if you were trying to answer the question, can your life really get better or worse? Um, I think every indication this got better in 2008, but buffer index would have indicated something completely different. Uh, some of the before and after studies, we were lucky. In the three years of data we had on our urban freeway sections, uh, eight different cities, were represented in that data set, we did find several uh, before and after conditions that we were, were able to study. Uh, one more point about, uh, about Atlanta, because this is a theme that we run through the rest of the program. Not, not the VMT, VMT change, but the man drop when the, uh, uh, the, the economy tank continued. The man went down, and so we think that was the primary reason for the change in, in congestion. There were some, some minor improvements that were uh, Rent meters, rent meters installed uh, mid-2008, mid-2008 to the late, later part of 2008. That's when the rent metering program really got, got, uh, got underway. And this, we believe most of that change is due to the dramatic drop in the VMT from, from the year 
from one year to the next. Um, one of the, one of the uh, projects we uh, had a before after study on was ramp metering in, in Seattle. You can see that uh, here the, the buffer index happened to behave nicely to have in accordance with the other, the, other, the other metrics, but we saw both an improvement in the average condition as well as, uh, as, well as reliability. Um, we looked at, we had several capacity projects as well in, in the mix. And intuitively, I guess you would expect uh, capacity projects to affect both the, uh, the average condition as well as reliability. But we entered this, this project saying that, well, mainly operations projects are the things that target those disruptions. The extreme days, so they're going to have the major effect on travel time reliability. What we saw here in the before and after studies is that's not entirely true. That the capacity projects <coughs> have equal or higher effect on, uh, on travel time reliability. Why is that? Well, reliability may uh, target those handful of extreme days when there are disruptions, but capacity affects every day. And if you have a corridor where there is recurring congestion, <coughs> rising tide floats all boats. It affects trips, maybe not, or travel times, maybe not to the same degree as operations will on those, on those very bad days, but it does it every day. So this is, this is something that proved to be a little bit uh, uh, un un unexpected from, from, the, uh, from, from the results. That both uh, re uh, operations projects targeting disruptions affect both the mean and, 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 and reliability metrics. And the same is true for, for capacity metrics, indicating that there really is a strong correlation between the, uh, the two phenomena. And in fact, uh, you're really, really just part of the same phenomenon is what the conclusion we came to. It's really just about congestion. Reliability adds another dimension to congestion. Just as we measure congestion <coughs> time and space, we also now have the ability to measure it uh, uh, over the course of time in addition to how it spreads on any, on any given day. The heart of the study was really the cross-sectional modeling that we did with the data sets. And we used the uh, <coughs> travel time distribution as the dependent variable, the indicator of, <coughs> of, of, uh, of, of both congestion and reliability, the distribution of, of travel time indices. Uh, we developed two levels of models, one that could be applied we had very little data on disruptions, just using uh, bare bones information that might be available in the planning application, the more sophisticated one, the data <coughs> entry model. Uh, in the data poor uh, modeling, uh, we saw this very strong correlation between the metrics in, that was first indicated by the uh, before and after studies, but we were able to uh, quantify its effect, and we were able to develop it for all all three types of highways for, for this particular case. So we weren't totally missing out on uh, rural freeways and signalized materials. Here's a good example of uh, the average travel time versus the 95th percentile. You see a very strong correlation here and, and the, the, uh, the, the model fit. Uh, this is another metric. This is the percent of trips on time, <coughs> if, assuming that they have to be completed at 30 miles per hour or higher and another shape shape of the curve, but the same basic relationship. So all these, all these metrics that are, we define on the upper end of the metrics can be, uh, of the distribution can be uh, predicted as a function of the, uh, uh, of the average condition. Um, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Our average condition actually includes everything. Uh, everything's in, that, in, in the mix. Uh, all the effects of disruptions, uh, uh, demand variability, capacity variability go into that number. If we're dealing with a modeling context, say a travel forecasting model, uh, all we have, we don't have that uh, as, our, as our estimate. We have simply the uh, recurring uh, mean con congestion level. So we need a way to get from the recurring mean to the overall mean. And uh, instead of doing more detailed modeling at this level, we carried on in the second level, we developed a, a very simplified method for adjusting based on, uh, based on the data that we had. Uh, very simplistic. Uh, stratospheric level because it doesn't account for the underlying factors that cause uh, that, that cause the variability. It's, a real, it's really a shortcut method, and this is one area where more additional research might be might be indicated. This is the uh, the, the curve that, that was fit to the data. You can see it's you know, again a strong correlation, but the um, uh, it's not which is mechanistic. It's it just purely descriptive. Uh, the more detailed modeling tried to get to the un underlying factors uh, controlling travel time reliability. And here we, we 
we, we basically did a, a large set of regressions in that regression analysis to identify the three that identified three primary factors for some of the some of the sources of congestion: demand, capacity, hours <coughs> lost due to disruptions of incidents in work, as well as uh, rain. Uh, we had some winter weather from Minneapolis, which was one of the data sets that we were dealing with. But that was the only the only data set we had with uh, with winter weather. And even there, it was kind of it was kind of funny when you started looking at the data. Um, if you looked at snow at days when it snowed in the morning, what you found is demand was really suppressed. People were, people actually stay home in, in Minneapolis. They know better than drive go out and drive in the snow. I'm like, that's not <coughs> If snow happened uh, midday or, or during the afternoon <clears> heat, <throat> that's when it really when it, when it really hit the fan. Those were the days when you had when people were already trapped at work trying to get home uh, and they got stuck got stuck in the snow. <coughs> so how to account for that that fact? The effect of extreme events on demand is something that we we did not tackle. So obviously, obviously an area for, for for further research. But winter weather is a shortcoming of the uh, sort of the models. Yeah, it's definitely not accounted for. Uh, I'm not sure it can be actually be accounted for given the fact that, that, that they, the fact that they are extreme events, uh, there's only a handful of them, and, this, and the crazy demand influences that you can, that you can get. But uh, in any event, we chose to ignore them because we, we, live in the, we live in the South where we, 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 know, we, of course we know better. Uh, but this was the basic, the, the basic model that we that we developed. Here's one. Here, those of you who like equations, here's one of the equations. I'm not going to present the, the thousands of them. This is what they, what they look like. The mean square errors were uh, not as good as I would expect. But if I was doing uh, uh, accident modeling, I'd be pretty happy with mean square errors of, of that of that magnitude. Now, what we did was uh, develop decide that we'd have a tiered mechanistic model. We would start with the most immediate influence on reliability. What's really causing the change in, in reliability? Well, uh, late hours lost due to, let's, let's just focus on incidents, <coughs> is the main, is the initial reason why uh, we, have, uh, we have an effect on travel time. Well, late hours lost are, are in turn a function of various characteristics of the incidents. So we developed a, a variety of ways to drill down to get to the underlying, to be able to predict the underlying factors involved in the, in, in, in the model so that you can relate it back to uh, the travel, to improvements and, and strategies that are, that are implemented. So we, it, so we developed this tiered model. I'm not going not to bore you with all, all the details, uh, but the, uh, it's basically you start tearing it apart, each factor in turn is a factor, is a function of other factors that can be related back to strategies. Uh, so the, the other major limitation, I think, of, of the uh, uh, statistical analysis was the fact that we were dealing with the good folks in terms in terms of data, uh, and these are folks who, by virtue of the fact they have good data, also have good programs, good operations programs, good incident management programs. Uh, grant meeting. They have implemented operations aggressive in terms of, of their strategies. So we didn't have any uh, areas where operations might, might uh, have just gotten started or were not implemented because it's uh, kind of a, uh, a catch-22. In order to have the data, you have to have the operation, operations deployed. But you wouldn't deploy the data collection systems unless you're going to do something with the data from a from a strategic standpoint. So that's one of the limitations, is that uh, all, the, all the data represent the people who are already doing aggressive operations uh, with the system. The other is that uh, they tend to be the larger areas where there are multi-lane freeways. Uh, Atlanta was one of our major, major sources, and you know how many lanes are on I-75 and, and 285, four, four to seven lanes. Um, the effective incidence on such uh, highways is a lot less than if you had uh, Two or three lanes in the, in the direction. The reason is the lane, uh, this incident blocks a single lane, will cause a uh, much greater impact. You only have two of them to begin with, as opposed to if you have uh, five. You've got excess capacity built in with those, with those, uh, those extra lanes. So those were some, two of the uh, perhaps major shortcomings of the, uh, of the model. Of the, of the uh, this showed congestion by source and how to develop the, uh, the, uh, 
congestion high. Um, or you would think with all this data, it would be easy to assign causality to a, a, particular, a particular condition. Uh, for if an incident occurred or bad weather occurred, you just say, ah, in this day, all the delay is due to uh, incidents. Well, it's not quite that easy. Because if you have the current bottleneck, some delay is <coughs> very anyway. So you have to develop a method for controlling for the fact that some delay would have occurred even in the absence of, of the disruption. And you can see the difference in the, in the estimates of, of the uh, attribution of the, of the various sources, controlling and, and, and not controlling. Um, so the method we developed in, in Seattle was, it seemed to work very well. Uh, the problem is we couldn't develop a model to be able to predict this uh, as an underlying factor because we had there was a lot of variability in the underlying data. Uh, this is late hours lost due to incidents, and this is percent delay, uh, let's say percent of recurring delay. So we really actually expect uh, a negative, negative slope here. You can kind of see that in the, in the data, especially on the upper, on the right half, but it's really, there's too much, simply too much scatter. So we, we, we failed in our attempt to develop a, an underlying model of uh, uh, congestion by source. It would be nice to be able to say, 15% uh, of the delay is due to incidents if you have these characteristics, or if you have the weather if you have these, these characteristics. But we, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't develop a statistical model that was that day. Uh, some of, the, some of the, uh, in the course of conducting the congestion by source analysis, some of the other uh, things that, that became uh, apparent to us is we start looking at what, what actually is causing delay. On, 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 on freeways, you can't separate out the effect of demand and volume. Volume is really, really the starting point for determining how bad the disruption is going to be. Certainly true in the middle of the night, if you have an incident, um, it may have absolutely no effect. Same incident right before the peak may have a major, major impact. So it's high, the, the effect of this, the uh, disruptions are highly dependent on the uh, demand level at the time of the, uh, uh, time of the, at the time of this the, uh, disruption. Uh, and we tried to quantify that in terms of where, the, uh, when, when our system is vulnerable to break down. What's the volume level, what's the threshold level at which uh, the system is, is vulnerable to, uh, to break down. Uh, if you look at when the disruptions occur, if it happens right before the peak, uh, you're, in, you're, in a bit, you're in pretty bad shape because you probably will you will never recover during, during the course of the period. It happens uh, in a very short time. Uh, before the peak. Uh, and th this notion of recovery, really, again, it's related to, to volume. It's, if you track when um, the demand on, on the section of the highway and when, when the incident occurred, you'll see that it's really more dependent on uh, the demand that's showing up at the spot as opposed to how long the incident actually actually lasts. Uh, the effects vary from corridor to corridor. We couldn't, we couldn't explain the variability in, uh, in, in the uh, corridor to corridor uh, analysis with the variables that we have. We suspect maybe there were some off-section uh, uh, situations, backups from uh, ter ramp termini, or backups from bottlenecks on other, other, other routes where an intersection route was, uh, was being joined. But we, we, we just simply couldn't uh, explain the corridor to corridor vari variation. Uh, another effect is in trying to do the assignment is if an, if an incident occurs upstream of a uh, uh, major bottleneck, the uh, performance of that bottleneck is going to be improved, a bit, again, because demand at the bottleneck is reduced. It's being metered by the, by the incident. So let's, uh, let's step back and try to do a, it's, it was a fairly boring study. A lot of equations, statistical relationships, graphs, charts. Uh, what, what can we make of all this that would make sense to a, uh, uh, policy -making. Well, the first thing is that reliability is not this separate thing. We, professionals tend to treat it that way, but it's, it's just simply not. It's uh, really that's just another aspect of, uh, of, of congestion, as we mentioned before. Uh, all types of highway improvements will improve both the typical condition and, and reliability. It's not just for reliability, it's not just for operations. Any improvement will tend to, uh, will, will improve reliability. Uh, because of that, uh, we've been missing a major benefit stream from analyzing our projects. We've been selling ourselves short, essentially, uh, in, in our 
economic analysis of transportation improvements by doing <coughs> uh, reliability because it's, it's an extra effect beyond the, uh, beyond the typical condition. The thing that just wouldn't die, the thing that kept popping up, the thing that surprised us throughout the study was the effect of line. We saw it in the before after studies, we saw it in the uh, Atlanta trend analysis, we saw it in the statistical modeling and the congestion by source. It's just clearly a, too important a factor to ignore. It's not just related to the characteristics of disruptions. It really starts with volume and its relationship to capacity. Uh, what that means for the profession is that strategies that affect demand are going to have uh, an equal, uh, should be on equal footing with, with operations because of their, their strong effect on, uh, on, on reliability. It's going to be an important aspect of future operation strategies, the more advanced strategies that we see in Europe, lane control, uh, speed harmonization, which are essentially demand management but at the uh, facility level. There are demand management strategies that happen at the trip level as well that will have a positive effect. But as operations moves into off the, into the, off the plateau or on into the next level, a lot of it is going to be focused on demand, and it's going to have a positive effect on the liability. So in five minutes, I'm going to talk about what's next for the for liability. Let me talk about the current Shark 2 projects that are, on, that are ongoing. Uh, the shortcut equations that we develop are good starting, <coughs> but they're not fully formed. They need to be uh, tailored to the individual applications. One of the applications is uh, to get them to work with travel demand forecasting models. So we can have estimates of reliability, both as an output from the system, in other words, what the performance of the system is, as well as be able to predict it at the front end of the travel forecasting <coughs> process where travelers are making decisions based on, on reliability. And we developed a, a, a simplified procedure for adopting those equations to a travel demand uh, forecasting. Yeah. Uh, another project is looking at, looking at the integration of advanced modeling, <coughs> uh, activity-based modeling, mesoscopic simulation, and uh, advanced <coughs> emissions, emissions modeling at a, at a regional scale. These, this uh, system too needs to consider reliability. And we're looking at ways of uh, incorporating the simple, again, the simplified uh, predictive relationships into this, this modeling, into this modeling. Uh, finally, another way to study reliability is to look at, is to try to model it more directly. Don't, don't use, uh, predict it based on statistical relationships. You need to choose a more uh, mechanistic approach. Uh, this is the project that's looking at incorporating reliability into the highway capacity manual. It's taking a scenario-based approach. In other words, it's setting up various conditions of disruptions, demand, and capacity levels, and uh, making multiple runs under those, under those scenarios to determine what the cumulative effect of all these, all these factors are interacting with each other uh, over time. So there is a, this seems to be a very common, the scenario approach seems to be a very common approach is being adopted for a lot of advanced reliability, uh, reliability modeling at this point. But it involves uh, separating out the factors, making multiple runs of the various combinations of the factors, basically a classical uh, experimental design approach. Um, beyond the, uh, what's, what's happening right now, what, what would be uh, good research topics that are, have been left unfulfilled by uh, sharp by sharp two year uh, well, clearly, signal lines highways is gaping hole. Nobody has tackled that. There are no plans to tackle that within the program. Uh, that's an area that's ripe for additional research. Congestion by source remains to uh, remains to be uh, 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 tackled as well. Uh, pre there has been some previous research. All the research has uh, has some some basic flaws in it. They, there are indicators of of, of what, what could be done, but. Predictive model will be very useful for practitioners to be able to uh, identify how much of the congestion is due to their resources so that uh, strategies can be tailored to it. And finally, the relationship between uh, operations policies, the incident management programs, and some of the more emerging uh, operations types like advanced uh, travel demand management strategies 
and your effect on reliability uh, remains to be seen. Those are strategies that we didn't have available to us when we undertook our research, for example. I think, that, I think that's it. We have 10 minutes uh, for questions. I know we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'm glad to entertain any questions. Uh, can you go back to the slide of <coughs> congestion by, by the source? By source? Yes. Oh, yeah. It's, um, to me, it sounds like the causes of the congestion, at least they below, um, people into two different categories. For example, like the instance and the construction. It looks like when they happen, uh, they happen in a very uh, <coughs> short segment. And they may cause like bottlenecks. But instead, like for the back water, it may affect a very long segment. So it looks like why is this create and otherwise continuous? So, I mean, of course, it's better to be different. Selection of where you set the viewfinder is something you have to have to decide. From. <coughs> over, what, over what distance are you going to measure travel time? What's your basic analysis unit? Um, and that is, a, you know, that's an issue. It's, a, it's a, a that you're, you know, there's really no good answer. You have to pick something that's reasonable and, and hold a constant and, and, and you use it throughout, throughout the rest of the analysis. For our purposes, we define urban freeway sections that are typically four to six miles <coughs> to do the analysis. Um, if there's a major bottleneck need to be out the downstream end, these are some of the principles that we use in defining the, the uh, study sections. Um, and they needed to represent kind of general uh, traffic flows, no major traffic generators uh, in, in the middle of the section. Uh, but we needed a, sec a reasonably length section over which to measure travel time, not too short because then you get highly localized effects, not too long because then you start diluting the effects of maybe a downstream bottle in your, in your measurements. Uh, it's four to six miles seemed to be a reasonable approach. Uh, that could, could be used in a variety of applications like performance monitoring uh, in highway capacity analysis we have a few facilities that tends to be a uh, like section but you're absolutely right you know what the length over which you measure your basic measurements are taken uh, influence the results um, I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about the difference between your data rich and your data poor environment, and it really relates specifically to when you have the money to do a large project like this versus practitioners when you really just have however much the DOT has to do this project. So I guess my question is more on, do you always keep the practitioner in mind when you're going through this study? Is this, are you always thinking down the road and saying, you know what, it's just impossible that they're always gonna have either perfect incident data or something like that, or are you trying to just say, Best scenario, given assuming everything works, here, here's what we're trying to develop. Yeah, we, we really try to keep the practitioner in mind when we develop the, the models. And even the data, data rich model, um, we develop the fault in ways to use the data that you do have available so you can generate the independent variables in, in, in the equations. Uh, whether, you know, you, you have to find weather records from somewhere. But if you had just bare, informa bare bones information, about instant characteristics, you could apply the, uh, the data, data rich model. Well, the, the modeling that we did here, I think, would be accurately described as sketch planning. Mm -hmm. They're simple statistical relationships uh, amenable to uh, sketch planning. You wouldn't use these models if you were doing uh, uh, microscopic simulation of a corridor, so you're going to the short corridor. You'd probably use a scenario or something like that. Model it directly. If you don't have, if you're looking at fairly large region, but you don't have a lot of data available to you, you don't have a microcentric model to calibrate it, then that's when you would use, use this. <coughs> so that's on, it's on that end of the spectrum in terms of modeling sophistication. Yeah, my question is with the um, incidents. Uh, so when you, when you listed the sources of the incident, you talk about <coughs> crisis and breakdowns, uh, do you take into consideration the physical condition I mean, there's the, just looking at the uses, but you take into consideration the physical infrastructure as to when the breakdown occurs, you know, with, with the infrastructure. I mean, the relation, how the infrastructure effect might affect the breakdown or, or crash? No, when, um, when the infrastructure <coughs> fails, the, the delays, the congestion that 
cause, that is caused as a result of the When you have a capacity breakdown and right. flow? Right. Um, we <coughs> tried to capture that with the demand and capacity uh, ratio. Uh, that was you know, one, of primary, one of the primary factors. It was the primary factor in those data-rich uh, data models. It <coughs> uh, wasn't physically collapsing the infrastructure, but traffic <coughs> breakdown and traffic flow caused by the interaction of volumes and capacities. Travel time equivalents. In other words, converting reliability <coughs> to travel time and using just a purely functional approach because the nativity model is based on travel times right now. It's not based on uh, how folks respond to, to reliability. Uh, so we're using basically adding reliability to travel time, creating this new thing called travel time equivalent just because the models are set up and we don't have resources to go in and recalibrate the activity model. Uh, you raise a good, another good point, and that is, in addition to setting the uh, physical distance on which you measure travel time, what time period, what time steps that you measure <coughs> Now, we kept, we kept the, the, the period, the peak periods here, constant from year to year. But, you know, in, in reality, if you look at 2008, you would say, well, the peak period actually shrunk in, in time. So if you, if, you, if you shrunk that, if you shrunk it in time, probably would find very little change in terms of congestion level or, or reliability just because you know you just got squeezed congestion into a small time. Uh, we kept we kept a constant because once you start floating, you know, floating those things it becomes you know, a snake eating its tail. Well I think it's it's interesting that you mentioned that because it's something that I've been thinking about and I think it's great if need anyone. So if you guys would join me and Thank you. Um, Susan has big garbage bags. Please. 